Hello, my name is John Jost. I'm the artistic director of the Peoria Bach Festival, and I would like to welcome you to Peoria Bach Festival 2021. Uh, we are delighted to be back in business this year after a year of silence. And even though we are on a reduced schedule, we do have several events. You can find the events on our Bach Festival website, Peoria Bach Festival website and uh, I'll announce some of them at the end. But uh, the first event is a lecture, which uh, originally was called Bach's Toolkit. And I originally planned to lecture on this for last year's Bach Festival, which was to feature one evening of Bach cantatas with the choir and one evening of music mostly for the orchestra. And as we all know, last year disappeared and may it rest in peace. In any case, this year we're not quite yet ready to have a choir perform indoors, and therefore there are no Bach cantatas. So I decided to save the Bach's toolkit lecture for next year, when it will make a little bit more sense to talk about some of his cantatas. For this year, I decided to repeat the lecture I gave in 2018, Bach the Architect, with some changes, additions, and deletions, and I'll use examples from music of this year's festival rather than the music of the 2018 festival. This lecture seems appropriate for this year, and I do ask forgiveness from those of you who still remember things you heard three years ago. Before I begin, there are a lot of people to thank, especially the pastors and the staff of Trinity Lutheran Church, and all of you who have donated funds to keep the festival going. We greatly appreciate your love for this music and your faith in us to produce it. But above all, I want to thank two people who have been intimately involved in previous festivals who are no longer with us. One is Peter Wessler, who died in November of 2020, and the other is Barbara Meissner, who died in April of this year. Pete played violin in the festival orchestra whenever he did not have a work conflict, and he was always a steady supporter of anything that we did. He was the type of person who would always go out of his way to be useful. Barb was a huge help from the very first concert we gave in 2003. The amount of behind the scenes work that she did from selling tickets, to finding housing, to making sure there was food for the musicians was incredible. And she was always a force for making sure the music at Trinity Lutheran Church was of the highest quality. These two wonderful people will be sorely missed. So allow me to introduce to you Bach the architect. When Mozart was in his late 20s, he wrote a letter to his father describing his latest piano concertos. They are very brilliant, pleasing to the ear, and not too vapid. There are passages here and there from which the connoisseurs alone can derive satisfaction. But these passages are written in such a way that the less learned cannot fail to be pleased though not knowing why. If Bach's music affects you, but you don't quite know why, then I hope this little talk will help. In all the talks I've given at these festivals, my aim is to present some of the ways Bach created and organized his music in the hope of helping to answer the most frequently asked Bach festival question. So what makes Bach's music so great? Bach did not write music just to please the ear, but neither did he write music to indulge in some sort of private intellectual exercise. He came from a large family of church musicians and was steeped in the traditions of his father. As a child, he learned to play, and to play expertly, the violin, the organ, and the harpsichord. He learned to compose in the traditional way by carefully copying out the music of other composers and trying to imitate their methods of musical construction. His schooling in grammar, mathematics, rhetoric, and the other traditional subjects was rudimentary, though he was good at math puzzles and had an extraordinarily keen mind for abstract concepts, certainly for abstract musical concepts. But why do I call Bach an architect? Let's look at the difference between an architect and a builder. If you're adding a room to your house or building a garage, 
You need a good builder who knows about construction and plumbing and wiring and building codes, but you don't necessarily need an architect. But if you are designing a church or an office building or the house of your dreams, you want an architect. A trained architect has an overview of things, how they all fit together, and can translate the ideas and vision of the client into reality. The architect has a thorough knowledge of the materials, resources, and techniques necessary to realize this vision. The architect is a designer who can imagine and, and in a sense, already see the finished project. The 17th and 18th centuries were a fertile time in the history of music. Baroque composers were prodigious in their production of music, much of it brilliant, much of it, like Handel's Messiah, enjoying regular enthusiastic performances down to the present day. And Bach was, of course, not the only outstanding composer. Handel, Telemann, Vivaldi, Corelli, Monteverdi, all wrote superb music, some of which you will hear in Marcia Henry Libano's String Chamber Music Concert tomorrow at 12.05. Uh, and tomorrow is or was June 10th, in case you're listening to this lecture later. But most of Bach's contemporaries were more like builders than architects, and I'll try to explain this. If you're in Europe visiting historic churches and you enter a 17th century Baroque church, you are struck by how rich and elaborate everything is. There's hardly a space that is not filled with a magnificent sculpture or painting or ornamented column. A history of architecture textbook explains it thus. Renaissance art and architecture had been characterized by stately reserve and balance. In contrast, Baroque art which followed it was one of deliberate emotional involvement and expression. The author cites the Reformation as containing the seeds for this change, the growing power of the individual over the power of society, both in the church and in the public institutions of society. The music of the late Renaissance, that is, of the late 1500s, was also marked by an atmosphere of stately reserve and balance, as epitomized by the motets of Palestrina. But as opera and music for keyboard instruments and concertos for the violin and other instruments became more popular, individual expression and emotional involvement became the hallmark of the new music as well as in the other arts. All of Bach's contemporaries had basically the same materials at their disposition, which is what gives a characteristic sound to all Baroque music. We'll take a quick look at these materials before proceeding to a brief examination of two movements of a work you will hear on our Friday night concert. First, we have the principles of rhetoric. I have spoken on this topic a few times, but here's a brief summary. The great Roman orator, orator Cicero laid down five principles of rhetoric. Invancio, or coming up with something to say, Dispositio, or arranging the material. Elocutio, or stylizing the material. Memoria, or memorizing the material. And finally, pronunciatio, or delivering the material. These are the basic principles you should follow if you're writing a lecture or a speech. The most important thing is to have something to say, something you believe is worth saying. Then you gather material that supports your idea. You identify the material that works best, you throw out the rest, and you arrange it in the strongest way possible. Then you revise it all and add some style. You iron out the rough spots, and you add just enough spice to minimize snoring in the audience. If you want to be especially impressive, you memorize the whole thing. I obviously skipped that step today. And you practice your delivery so people think you are actually speaking to them and not to your iPhone. I had the good fortune to spend four years of my life as a teacher in Haiti, where the blend of French and West African culture has produced a tremendously verbal society. Oratory is highly prized. 
I could never win an argument with my students. Graduation speeches are popular, and some of the best preaching I ever heard was in Haitian churches, and I almost never saw a preacher use notes. In Bach's time, every schoolboy studied rhetoric, and composers approached the writing of music using the same principles with some alterations. Christoph Bernhardt, Bernhard, a 17th century German composer and theorist, reduced Cicero's five principles to three in their ap application to writing music. In Vanzio, you still need to come up with ideas. Elaboratio, working out and arranging your musical material. And finally, Executio, performing your finished piece. Invention alone does not guarantee a successful product. Too many would-be composers think that all you have to do to write music is come up with a good tune. But the discipline of the craft requires detailed study of the procedures available for manipulating your material. However, that first principle is important. Bach, brilliant musician that he was, was not a patient teacher. If a student of his couldn't come up with good ideas, Bach told the student to forget about being a composer. And that's probably still good advice today. A good Baroque composer was also intimately familiar with the national styles of music popular at the time, principally the Italian and French style. Italian music was known for its energy, driving rhythms often containing passages of repeated notes, plenty of imitation of short melodic motives, though little use of actual canons or fugues, a melodious singing style in slower movements, but an essentially extroverted atmosphere. The French style, French music, was more elegant, primarily using dance rhythms, and generally calmer in temperament. All of the French dance rhythms that had been popularized in French ballrooms were known to composers throughout Europe. The minuet, the saraban, bourree, gavotte, Gig, and many others. There was also a German style, but it was more related to form than style, more intellectually complex, involving fugues and more elaborate working out of the material. Bach was an absolute master of all the current styles, and even the more complicated procedures seemed like child's play to him. Whenever he heard a new piece of music, he could instantly analyze it and add whatever was new or useful to his own musical arsenal. The doctrine of the affections held great influence in Bach's time. Music was supposed to express particular emotions, joy, sorrow, anger, contentment, and you will hear these various effects in all the music we perform at this festival. As a rule, in the Baroque era, only one affect reigns throughout an entire movement, for instance, joy or sorrow. And this is one of the huge changes in the classic era of Mozart and Haydn, where emotions and topics change constantly. There were also traditional forms, two-part or AB form, most often used in dance movements, three-part or ABA form, one of the most logical forms. For instance, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. That's A. Up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. That's B. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. That was A again. ABA it, and its variations is probably the most used form. There's the rondo form, A, B, A, C, A, D, A, E, A, etc., a constant refrain with contrasting sections in between. There's the fanta fantasia, which is a free form, form, often a written down improvisation. And we think that a lot of Bach's music was music that he had improvised at the organ and then decided to write down. And his improvisations <laughs> apparently were incredible. The ritornello form, this was a newer form popularized by Vivaldi 
in his concertos. Ritornello means little return, as in the rondo form, it features a refrain that keeps coming back between a series of contrasting episodes in which the soloist displays virtuosity, but each refrain is in a different key area which helps build up tension until the final return of the refrain in the home key. And if you didn't get all that, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Harmonic polarity became much stronger in the Baroque era than previously. It's difficult to explain this without getting more technical than I intend to today, but suffice it to say that once the piece of music has, has established its home key, say G major, and then it starts to move away, the increasing distance makes the pull of home that much stronger. It's a kind of musical homesickness, and the more artfully the composer delays the return home, the stronger that moment of arrival becomes. There were also musical devices. Sequences are the same material repeated at least twice, each time one degree or higher or lower, sorry, one degree higher or lower, and I'll demonstrate that a little bit later. There was the cannon or round, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Next person, row, row, row your boat. And then there was the fugue, and that's from a word meaning to chase. It's similar to cannon, but it's a little more elaborate. The different entries of the theme can be altered slightly, and when each successive voice enters, the preceding voice plays different music that complements the voice that has just entered. This was Bach's specialty. Writing a fugue that sounds good requires all the intellectual pro prowess a composer can muster, and no one surpassed Bach and Handel at this craft. French and Italian Baroque composers, as a rule, didn't have the patience or the interest. Mozart and Haydn were good at writing fugues, but they generally reserved it for the religious music. By the time of Beethoven, composers struggled with it, Beethoven especially. In fact, we understand that Beethoven was usually cursing Handel under his breath all the time he was trying to write a fugue. And speaking of Handel, nothing in this lecture about the greatness of Bach is meant to denigrate the music of Handel, whose music we will also perform Friday night. He was born in the same year as Bach and enjoyed the reputation in his time as the greatest composer of Europe. I never get tired of hearing Messiah or any of Handel's oratorios, and his operas contain music of the greatest sublimity. Handel's music, in fact, is generally more immediately accessible than is Bach's music. It's more extroverted, it's not as intricate or elaborate, and mostly it's not as difficult to perform and Handel wrote sublime melodies. But Handel's music does not excite the in-depth study that Bach's music demands. In Bach's music, one finds layer upon layer of careful design. Both composers wrote their music quickly to meet deadlines, but whereas Handel often fell back on formulas he'd used before, or even whole passages of music he uh, he had used before or bought, borrowed from other composers, Bach continually excavated new ground. And when he did borrow from himself or others, he always altered the material or improved it in some astounding way. Like a gifted and careful architect, he had an awareness of design as he employed each element in the creative process of writing music. One of Bach's first biographers, Nicholas Fortel, described Bach's musical thinking as consisting of three parts, order, coherence, and proportion. Now, proportion is probably the most important quality in a great work of art, and the ability to establish proper proportion to be the most necessary quality of a great artist. Proportion is important even in abstract art. Order, is the process of laying out one's materials and discovering what possibilities they contain. Coherence, or continuity, is combining these materials in a way that makes sense to the artist. And proportion is reworking everything 
to establish balance between the expected and the unexpected. Great art contains enough of the expected to establish points of reference, but also enough of the unexpected to inspire interest and awe. We're going to take a brief look at two movements from a work that we'll perform this Friday night, Bach's Brandenburg Concerto No. 4. Bach's six Brandenburg Concertos are a marvel just by nature of the six combinations of instruments that he chose for each one. Most of these combinations were never used before him and have rarely been used since. Number four was written for two recorders, violin and string orchestra. The recorder, which is held vertically, was already beginning to become an obsolete instrument, being replaced by the transverse flute held horizontally, which had greater power. But Bach uses the recorder masterfully, drawing upon the sweetness of its tone as well as the possibilities of its virtuosity. And for the violin in this concerto, he writes some of the most rapid passage work ever conceived for the instrument. This movement is a brilliant demonstration of Bach's use of the ritornello form. This form, as al I already stated, is a sort of A-B-A-C-A-E-A -A -A form. What drives it and gives it energy is that each restatement of A is a little different. Without getting too technical, each restatement has a different feel to it and is generally in a different but related key area. And if you're not familiar with the musical concept of key areas, let me explain it with the idea of home I used before. In the rondo form, A, B, A, C, A, etc., you start your journey from home, you go a little ways north, then you come back home, then you go south, then you come back home, then you go east, home, west, home, and then you stay home. It's a very useful and flexible form. Bach used it, Mozart loved it. The ritornella form is very similar, but a bit more complex. You start from home and go north, and you stay at a relative's house, say your cousin's. Uh, this is how you save money on vacations. Then you go east for a while and stay at your uncle's. You go south, stay with your grandmother. Then you go west, and then you return home. Now, this doesn't quite do justice to the power of the ritornello form, but it might help to say that you left your spouse at home and you miss them, and every relative you visit talks about how wonderful your partner is and how happy you will be to see them again. So your longing to return home increases as you travel, and this gives more pleasure and sort of satisfying feeling to the final return home. The first movement of Brandenburg IV is an ideal example of how Bach took the ritornello principle that Vivaldi developed and expanded and elaborated it to the ultimate degree. Whereas Vivaldi in his concertos usually states his main idea four or five times, Bach restates his opening idea no more than 10 times, plus adding short fragments of it here and there. The opening one and a half minutes and the closing one and a half minutes of this movement are exactly the same. And this is a device almost every Baroque composer uses. Then the intervening four minutes develops the material used already while adding some new material. This gives us an overall ABA structure, very symmetrical and satisfying. The motifs that Bach uses in this opening and closing section are as follows. Motifs A, B, C, D, E, and F. And I will attempt to play these on the piano, and if you can learn them by heart, you'll understand what's going on in the first movement of number four. And I should add that, um, I should add that in order to hopefully prevent confusion, I'm using A uh, to refer to a motif now instead of a structure. Anyway, here's A. That's the one that you hear over and over, at least 10 times plus fragments of it. 
That's followed by B. Hmm. Let me try that again. And this is where he employs a sequence. The next two measures is. And the next two bars is. So it's the very same thing, just one degree higher. And again, that seems to heighten the tension. Motif C sounds like this, one. Motif D, which uh, begins kind of an improvisatory passage for violin, which probably um, came into being as an improvisation that Bach did, goes like this, one. Motif E goes one. Let me do that again, one. And let me add that this motif features the recorders each of the two times that it comes around. Then the last motif, motif F, goes like this. a little something about that later. So again, let me just uh, please note that I'm using letters to refer to motifs rather than structures. The opening section uses these first three motifs as follows, A, B, A, C, A, B. So it starts out we hear that again and then we hear the orchestra going etc. That's followed by a return to A, and then we have C, one. Bach keeps a sense of, oh, and in the middle section, he continues to play with these same three motifs, but he adds three others, D, E, and F. And he keeps a sense of coherence or continuity by alternating the new motifs with ones that we're already familiar with. And then he keeps our interest by constantly changing the instrumentation, sometimes featuring the violin solo, sometimes the two recorders, and sometimes the orchestra. Just for fun, in the middle, he writes a fairly long section for the violin solo of rapid fire notes that go like the wind. And the next time we hear the violin, it's playing chords on three strings at the same time. So he's constantly changing the sound of the ensemble while he's doing all these other things. Now here's a chart of the way Bach uses all these motifs in the first movement of Brandenburg IV and how many times he uses each motif or section. I promise you I will not go through this, but he starts with A one time, B one time, A the second time, C one time, A the third time, D the third time, nope, second time. Anyway, you kind of see how it works. Another way Bach keeps things interesting is adding little fragments of some of the early motifs to other motifs. In the opening section, he adds hints of the first motif to the B section and hints of the second motif to the C section. This process continues throughout the movement, and it's one of the ways Bach distinguishes himself from his fellows. All Baroque composers worked with tight deadlines, and most of them were happy to have an appealing melody that they could rip on a bit, plus a good bass part. So interior parts, the second violins and the violas, did not get much of the action. This situation reaches its peak much later in the waltzes of Johann Strauss. Uh, you may particularly enjoy the waltzes of Johann Strauss. If you're a second violinist, or violist, you despise the waltzes of Johann Strauss. Because uh, as a veteran second violinist and violist, I can assure you, all we do is play this. Anyway, Bach didn't write music like that. He wrote all of his parts quickly, but painstakingly. As an example, the last motif, F, which occurs twice near the end of the middle section, contains a little hidden three-part canon involving the first violins, second violins, and violas. 
So while the first violins are going, uh, actually while the soloist is doing that, the first violins are doing the same thing two notes later, and the second violins are doing the same thing four notes later, so it sounds something like this. That's with two of the parts, with three of the parts. And I can almost guarantee that you won't hear that. It's just some a little extra fun that he wanted to have. Another trick that Bach learned from Vivaldi is to wander through the various key areas. Almost every time we hear this first motif, it's in a different key. And I won't go into this topic very much since it's hard even for trained musicians to always know what key they're in, but the effect on even non-musicians is that we have temporarily moved to a new country or neighborhood and we feel just slightly not at home until we return to the, we return to the beginning key area and feel a sense of completion. So again, it's this idea of tension building up until we finally make it back home. Now in the second movement, and I'll be much briefer here, Bach uses a whole different structural principle. Here the principle is contrast between the orchestra and the three solo instruments as a unit. Here's a chart of what the first part of the movement looks like. Two measures of orchestra, two measures of solo, etc. Mostly the soloists repeat what the orchestra just played, though sometimes it's the reverse. For the voicing is higher in the trio since the solo violin takes over the bass part. And when you hear this, this slow movement of the Brandenburg number four, it's almost as if you have two measures of the divine followed by two measures of mortal, and then two measures of divine and two measures of mortals again. And it's quite a gripping effect. Um, this is quite remarkable. Okay, one of the hidden devices in the first few measures is the octave ease in the bass. And then when the violin takes over the bass part, it goes up even farther. And this sound adds to the tension of the opening theme, which you're probably not going to even be aware of. And uh, even, the theme, even without this effect, creates this feeling of yearning or pulling apart. It's a perfect example of a great composer working with the principles that all artists work with, tension and release. Of course, other composers designed their music too with careful attention to form. They did not create it haphazardly, but none of them was as painstaking with detail as was Bach. As I said at the beginning, when you visit a Baroque church, you're, you're awestruck by the intricacy of detail. Quite probably, if you found yourself in an area of the church hidden from view of the general public, you would still find attention to detail, a little statue or painting created solely for the glory of God. This is quite different from the construction of buildings in a time when the most important factor is cutting costs. When you delve into the details of the music of Bach, you find the same careful attention. Bach's employers for most of his life, the town council of Leipzig, did not understand or fully appreciate him, and his music was not widely known outside of his own town. But his personality, skill, and drive rendered him almost incapable of doing less than his very best in his every effort. Bach's Brandenburg Concertos are among his most popular works. They are joyful, uplifting, entertaining, and yet they contain great depth of feeling and great compositional skill. It is ironic that Christian Ludwig, the Duke or Margrave of Brandenburg Schwedt, to whom they were dedicated, probably never even looked at the music. The score was found unused in the Margrave's library after his death and sold for the equivalent of $25. But in a sense, Bach had the last word because the only thing Christian Ludwig of Brandenburg is known for nowadays is the Brandenburg Concertos. Bach's musician friends understood the uniqueness and genius in his music, but his employers and many of his congregants 
were baffled or even offended by his music. He did not receive constant admiration. Publishers were not vying with each other for the rights to publish his music. And there's evidence that at a certain point in his life, he got tired of writing cantatas and decided to write other things. But he could not bring himself to write bad music or even mediocre music. As you hear Bach's music the next few days, keep in mind that here was a man who could work without affirmation, without praise from the people he served. He just kept writing great music day after day. And if you're still with me, thank you for listening. Tomorrow's concert at five minutes after 12 noon features violinist Marcia Henry Libano and some of her former students who now have professional careers throughout the country, performing Baroque chamber music. Friday's concert, also at five minutes after 12, features renowned pianist John Orff performing music of lament, either written by or inspired by Bach. Our Friday evening concert at 7.30 features Brandenburg Concerto No. 4, Bach's Oboe Concerto in F, Handel's Concerto Grosso Op. 6 No. 1, and Handel's sacred solo motet for soprano, oboes, and strings entitled Silete Venti, or Silent Ye Winds. Our soloists are all wonderful, and we hope you can tune in to the Peoria Bach Festival website. And if you miss any of these events, they will remain on the website so you can watch them at any time later. And Sunday, you are welcome to come in person to any of Trinity Lutheran Church's three services at 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11 a.m. And you will hear our soprano soloist, Courtney Huffman, singing arias from Bach Cantatas with Peter Weichert on the organ. Again, thank you for listening.